in that. All right, awesome. Hi, everybody. I'm Master Sergeant Laura Arnold. I've been in the Air Force for 18 years. I'm currently serving as an officer sessions recruiter. Um, and here with me, I have Sergeant Branham. How's it going, everybody? Uh, Sergeant Branham, been in the Air Force for over 20 years now. I'm an aircraft maintainer by trade, F-16 guy. Um, came back into recruiting at the end of my career just so I could help people such as yourselves out. And uh, yeah, I'm here to help. Colonel Luna. Hi, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Mary Beth Luna. I've been an Air Force laboratory officer for 27 years. Started off as a reservist in the Air Force. Liked it so much, I went active duty and uh, didn't, expect, didn't expect to stay this long, but it has been an, an incredibly wonderful ride. That's why I'm still an Air Force officer. Next slide, please. All righty, so here's the agenda of the items we're gonna talk about. We're talking about eligibility. I'm gonna give you a little description of what we do and what are the advantages of being a lab officer in the Air Force as, as opposed to being a laboratorian in the civilian sector. I'll talk about some of the training benefits and uh, we'll answer any questions you may have. Next slide, please. All righty, first of all, to join us in the Air Force, you have to be uh, you have to pass the physical, you have to be a citizen. You can't be older than 42 years old. Now to be a lab officer, we are very strict about the degree that you have. You have to have a bachelor's degree and in a hard science, it has to be a chemical degree, physical or biological science or a medical technology or medical lab science degree from an accredited university. Now you're gonna go through, um, an interview with us, one of us lab officers, it might be me, one, me, one of my colleagues, but we look specifically at your degree to see how much of a background you have in order to be able to be commissioned as a biomedical laboratory scientist. The other entry point you must have is you have to have a certified, be certified as a medical laboratory scientist by the American Society for Clinical Pathology. That is the only board that we accept. Another way for you to become a lab officer is that you get a specialist in blood banking certification from the American Society for Clinical Pathology. Next slide, please. What do we do every day? Now, as a laboratory and in the Air Force, you're not gonna be on the bench testing every day. That's what we have our enlisted lab techs doing and we also have our civilians doing that. But rather as a biomedical laboratory officer, you are a leader, you're directing, you're supervising, you're coordinating everything in that laboratory in order to generate quality laboratory results. So you were the manager, you're the overseer, you're not necessarily on the bench unless you were deployed. One of the things we also do is we conduct scientific analyses. Now, sometimes it does get pretty rough in the laboratory and we end up having to step in on the bench, but that is a rare occasion. Those of us who are on doing scientific analysis full-time are usually in the research area. And I'll talk about that in the next few slides. We also are teachers. So we, as you already know that we already have a bachelor's degree, some of us have master's and doctorate's degrees, but we're also responsible for teaching our young laboratorians more about testing, more about regulatory compliance. We also teach providers, we also teach senior officers about the nuances of the clinical laboratory medicine field. So that's the scientific part of what we do. We also do administrative work such as maintaining the records management program in accordance with the Air Force regulations. We oversee quality control regulations in accordance with the Clinical Lab Improvement Act of 1988, College of American Pathologist regulations, and the Department of Defense Manual 6440.02, which is the Department of Defense's Clinical Laboratory Improvement Program. We look over equipment and instruments to make sure that they're working well. That doesn't mean you necessarily have to put your hands in the instrument and do maintenance above and beyond what you would do to run them, but you are responsible for overseeing the equipment and instruments. And if they do break down, you're responsible for making sure they get back up again. 
we supervise as laboratory officers. For those of you who are coming from the private sector, you may or may not supervise people. Most of the time you're supervising the tests that you're running. But in the Air Force, your primary job is to supervise the technicians that work for you. Your technicians can be military or they are military and it can be Air Force, Navy and uh, Army lab techs, or they can be civilian lab techs as well. Then they can even be contract personnel. But regardless of who you supervise, you are responsible for growing them, teaching them, and moving on them up to the next level. Laboratory scientists also are scientists in the research development and acquisition setting. Now, there are three tracks for laboratory officers to follow in the Air Force career. One is the command track, the second is the clinical track, and a third is the research and development track. So we have a few of our lab officers that work strictly in the science and technology realm, where they serve as scientists, consultants to the private sector or to our own Air Force research labs, or even within research labs that are joint, such as Navy, Army, and Air Force. You can deploy. That is the difference between us and our colleagues in the civilian sector. We go wherever the president and our nation needs us to provide laboratory support. But most of the time we're out downrange providing blood and blood products because blood and blood products are the laboratory is direct tie to the readiness of our Air Force. So yes, although you're a laboratory scientist coming, you're coming into the Air Force, you're first and foremost an officer and we will teach you how to be ready downrange, just like that gentleman in the picture on the slide. He is working in a tent. So not all our facilities are hardened facilities. We could be working in a tent. You could be working in the heat. You may not have running water, but we make it happen. Next slide, please. All righty. Training us at Air Force Biomedical Laboratory Officer, you're gonna be part of one of the five different cores within the Air Force Medical Service. The first core is Medical Corps, Nurse Corps is the second one, Medical Service Corps, which is your admin folks, and then, then Dental Corps, and then we are the Biomedical Sciences Corps. In the BSC Corps, there are 14 Air Force specialty codes, and one of them is the Biomedical Laboratory Officer. Since you're already trained as a lab officer, you will come in a direct commission, come in. If you choose to come active duty, we send you to the commission officer training program at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. But because you're already a certified laboratorian, the Air Force does not teach you how to be a biomedical laboratory officer. That has already been determined by your degree and your certification. Next slide, please. benefits. So why would you want to be a lab officer in the Air Force as opposed to staying in scrubs in the civilian sector? Well, first of all, this uniform is just as comfortable as those scrubs that we wear out in the private sector. We do have an excellent starting salary and the beauty about becoming an Air Force officer is that you get a pay raise every year. Whereas in the private sector, sometimes you have to wait for someone to vacate a position before you are promoted. In the Air Force, you do your job, you do it well, you go above and beyond and take care of your people and your mission, you will promote. And there's a steady pathway to promotion. We have 30 days of vacation, whereas in the private sector, it's usually two and a half days, I'm sorry, uh, about four hours per pay period. Our benefits, is, our benefits for vacation time is very, very generous because we do ask a lot of our laboratory officers, but 30 days of paid vacation every year. Next, we have a great amount of continuing education opportunities. Continuing medical education credits are very expensive in the private sector. We take care of that for you. A lot of the times we offer free CME online or we send you to a, uh, TDY, a temporary duty, in order to get your CMEs. We offer tax-free housing and food allowance and probably the best medical care and dental care you will see anywhere in the country. The Air Force also gives you opportunities to live, work, and travel in places you would have never, ever dreamt of. And because of those opportunities, it makes it absolutely satisfying to serve in uniform. And lastly, we have a great retirement program. I'm sure your recruiters could tell you more about that. 
Next slide, please. Here are the advantages, and I have already alluded to a lot of this, but the biggest advantage really is the education. We're training you over and over again. We train, 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 train. It doesn't cost you a dime to train. We just ask for you to serve your country. In addition, we have uh, possibilities for you to get a master's and doctorate degree through the Air Force. And um, we offer master's degrees in uh, molecular biology and a PhD in toxicology. That's not free. You have to compete. You have to do well in your record. And you have to come back and serve the Air Force for a certain amount of time to go to grad school. But during grad school, you're getting a full pay and benefits. No, no more eating ramen noodles and having to waitress or be a, a food servant to survive. Next slide, please. All righty, at this point, I'll pass it on to our wonderful recruiters to take over. Off to you guys. Awesome, thank you. Um, so yeah, your next steps in the process if you're interested in doing this program is that you have to complete an initial appointment with either myself or Sarah Brano. Uh, and then from there, we're going to ask you for certain documents, as you can see listed here. Once your initial appointment is complete and we verify that everything is accurate and correct in your file, we'll go ahead and we'll create a profile for you and we'll get you over to a preprocessor who's going to get you scheduled for your military physical, which is just like a doctor's physical. And that happens at a MEPS, which is a military entrance processing station. Um, from there, you're going to start building your application package, uh, which is where you're going to need your interview, along with um, all of the items that are in the checklist as well. Um, and then once your package is completed, uh, we'll go ahead and submit that to the Air Force headquarters. And once the headquarters selects you, uh, you'll be ready to go into training. All right. So that's basically the slideshow in a whole. Um, I do have a couple questions for you, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Lena, if you have a moment. Uh, sure. These are typical questions that we get from the field. I know you already mentioned the deployments. Um, how often, though, do you guys actually deploy as medical lab office officers? Recently, we deployed a lot more frequently because of COVID, but typically, uh, it really depends on where you're assigned. So if you're an air combat command, you're probably going to deploy every two years. I would say probably once every three or four years. It's not as frequent as most of our colleagues have to deploy, but totally manageable. Awesome. And then like how long would that stint be? Is it a four, six months? Is it a month? Six months. Six months. OK. Um, and then per day, I know as an officer, you're probably not seeing patients, as you already mentioned. Um, but per day, what would you say your patient load would work look, would look like? And also, um, what kind of population would you serve? So patient load, again, that depends on the size of our facility. So some of our smallest facilities, uh, like the ones in Northern United States, they don't have a big population to serve. So they would maybe see 30 to 50 patients a day. Whereas big facilities like Eglin or Wilford Hall, they could see as many as 300 a day. So okay. it, it just really varies depending on what the mission of that base is. And what was the other part of your question? Um, I think you hit it. I think that was it. Okay. <laughs> um, All righty. And that's, that's really it. Um, I think you hit my other questions that were already listed on here. But okay. um, yeah, if you guys are interested, please uh, email us at this org box here at the top, as you can see on the screen. Um, and we'll be sure to get with you and take your information and get your process started. And thank you so much, Lieutenant Colonel Luna, for being a part of this presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, and we'll be in talk soon. All right. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks.